For almost 25 years, almost as long as there is PHP, cross-site scripting has been one of the most common risks for web applications. Yet today, there are many ways to protect a web application from attacks. This talk discusses why cross-site scripting is dangerous and covers countermeasures, including content security policy, trusted types API, and protection in SPA frameworks. Christian Venn says that after this talk there's almost no excuse to get XSS. Christian is an author, consultant, and trainer focusing on web technologies. He wrote or co-wrote over 100 books, is a fixture at international developer conferences since 2001, and the lead author of the Zend PHP certification. His day job includes migrating old code bases, implementing complex web applications, and making software more secure. Today, he will give a live speech. Let's start. M much too much too kind, much too kind. Just wait what's about to come and then you can burst in, uh, in standing ovations. Uh, no, um, it's, it's security time. Um, so uh, this talk and the next talk, and you're allowed to leave this room after this talk, but you must come back for my second talk, um, will, will be on security. So the order in which those two talks will be done is a bit weird. Um, the, the more general all web application security risks from a PHP perspective will come uh, at uh, five. Uh, and now, uh, in, in the first talk, we are talking about something very, very specific. So we've, we've all gathered here uh, for an hour of, of, of mourning, right? Because we are, we are saying farewell to an old friend, well, not an old friend, to, to an old enemy, because uh, today is the end of uh, cross-site scripting. Um, I've, uh, I've started uh, doing web development uh, early on, so I, I was a PHP early adopter. And then I eventually discovered web application security as a topic for myself uh, in about 2001 or 2002. And thought, <coughs> being over 20, 20 years younger and maybe more, more idealistic, um, OK, so this would be a temporary phase. I would work on, on web application security for a while, but eventually the problem would go away. Um, well, here I am. I still have great fun with web application security. Don't get me wrong, but still, it's, uh, it saddens me from time to time that some of the things that I, I personally learned over 20 years ago, is, that's still a thing, that's still a risk. And um, if you look at the, the absolute numbers of incidents, then an attack that is uh, from, from the absolute numbers, the most common one successfully done against web applications, even today, is cross-site scripting. So in this hour, what I'd like to do is, first, I'd like to find out why, why is cross-site scripting still a thing? Because, I mean, it sounds, cross-site scripting sounds kind of trivial to do and trivial to protect against, but somehow that's not the case. And uh, after we've discussed this and see why cross-site scripting is such a problem, we'll talk about countermeasures. Countermeasures we can do in our code, countermeasures that some frameworks have done for us. I'm specifically looking at JavaScript frameworks. And then I'd like to show you one, two, or three uh, defense and dev technologies. So uh, approaches that do not prevent a cross-site scripting flaw in your application but may prevent that someone exploit that flaw, right? So at the end of this talk, as uh, this, uh, this, uh, this fantastic voice, that's why I had to record this, that what the fantastic voice uh, just said, um, that there's no excuse to, to have cross-site scripting at all when following those, uh, those guidelines. And I mean, the term cross-site scripting is a little bit weird, right? I mean, I understand scripting, but cross-site, what's that? Uh, I have no idea. Now, it turns out uh, the, the term was coined in late 1998 by the Internet Explorer team. Do we need to say more? No, I mean, uh, supposedly they had like 10 suggestions on a, on a, flip, a flip chart. Yeah, and that was supposedly the best one. So uh, a little bit sad. Let's talk about uh, how cross-site scripting works um, in, in a bit. Uh, but, but don't worry, I don't want to bore you that much with, hey, this is cross-site scripting. 
but I need to set the context because that also contributes and pays in the, the countermeasures we are about to discuss. But first about my claim with those numbers. Here's, here's just a chart I uh, took from cvedetails.com. So CVE is a common vulnerabilities and exposures. That's basically for, for every security risk, there is a number assigned to that. And then over the year, it's counted how often which, uh, uh, which vulnerability was, was found. And so this is the chart for, for cross-site scripting. And I took this diagram uh, end of September this month. Why end of September this month? Because uh, I hope you can see it from the back as well, or if you're watching the video. Um, it starts at 2013 on the x-axis and goes till 2023. And so end of September was the first uh, time I noticed that the 2023 values surpassed the 2022 ones. But wait a minute. So let's just assume it's, it's, it's kind of the, the, the vulnerabilities are found are linearly uh, or evenly distributed uh, throughout the year. So end of September, three quarters of the month gone, but still three months to go. So we would need to add one third to get the number that we will likely have at the end of this year. So it would be off the charts uh, verbatim. Uh, in the true sense of, of the word, right? So cross-site scripting still is a big problem. I mean, I had my, um, I, I had some times where I thought, where I, again, I thought that the problem would go away. So look at 2016, you know, numbers went down. But then, well, these are absolute numbers. I have to be honest here. And since more and more applications are going in the web, those absolute numbers are likely to grow anyway. But still, it's still a big, big problem problem uh, and therefore it's a relevant threat and that's why we have to tackle this even if you think we are safe anyway so that term I already mentioned it cross-site scripting is a bit weird in most cases and it's important in most cases the attack is basically injecting JavaScript code into an HTTP response I say in most cases because there are some vectors of that attack where you don't inject JavaScript, but uh, maybe HTML markup or something else. And there's a variant of cross-site scripting where you don't inject something into the HTTP response, but it all happens in the client in the browser, so-called DOM-based cross-site scripting. I quickly discussed this today, and I'll also mention it uh, in, in the next talk again. Um, and now, OK. When, whenever you're going to see a demonstration of cross-site scripting at a conference or somewhere else, usually it's someone shows you, hey, I can eject script alert one. Yeah, super boring. I'll do the same today. Don't worry, right? But still, is, is, that, is that a threat? No, because that code runs in the security context of the page. And before we proceed here, let me, let me quickly uh, show you what, uh, um, what, what that means. So. Um, You've all heard the story, right? JavaScript was cobbled together in 10 days. So in 10 days, the JavaScript language was conceived, um, designed, and implemented. I don't know what you are capable of doing in 10 days. I, I'm certainly not doing that. And on the 10th day, there supposedly was still some time for security. And what was developed then was something called the same origin policy. And that, that's important to, to uh, fully understand the, the gravity of having JavaScript code injected. So the same origin policy, again, a weird term. What's, what's origin? Here in that case, origin is used as defined by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. And the origin is a part of a URL. The origin of a URL is the scheme, so the protocol the fully qualified domain name, and the port. And basically, the same origin policy says uh, that the JavaScript code has access to things, quote unquote, that have the same origin as in IETF's origin as the JavaScript code. Let's have a look at a quick example. So I have some, some page here, some, some URL. So what's, what's the origin as in IETF's origin definition of that URL? Yeah, it's HTTP example.com port 81. Scheme, domain, port. If it's the default port, so 80 for HTTP or 443 for HTTPS, then that port doesn't need to be part of that origin term. And let's just assume that this page is using JavaScript three times. 
There is some inline JavaScript code, so that's the uh, orange box in the top left. There is some uh, JavaScript file on the same server that is loaded via script tag. And there is some other JavaScript file we are pulling from a CDN. I'm just using jQuery here because it's the most popular one, uh, but I mean, it doesn't really matter what, what kind of uh, library that is. Now, what is the origin of those, two, uh, those three uh, instances of uh, JavaScript? Remember, the protocol, domain, and port. So the origin of the inline uh, JavaScript code, top left, is obviously HTTP example.com port 81, right? Must be the same of the, as the HTML page. Top right, origin is HTTP example.com port 81. Easy. What is? the origin as in the same origin policy of the JavaScript library here. Now, the intuitive answer is, wait, wait, wait a minute, origin, was, what does that mean? I have no idea what the IETF is. Um, let's, let's, where, where something comes from. Oh yeah, I, I know where the JavaScript file is from. It's from uh, HTTPS code.jQuery.com. And of course, that's uh, absolutely uh, incorrect because if that was the case, then the, the origin of that JavaScript file would be a different origin than the HTML page has. So that, Java, that code in that JavaScript file would not be allowed to, say, change the DOM. I would guess that almost everyone here in this room, once in their life, have uh, loaded a JavaScript library from a remote server, and that library worked, right? So what is the correct, but maybe not intuitive answer? The origin, as in same origin policy of that JavaScript library here is HTTP example.com port 81. The origin of any JavaScript code is the origin, as in the IETF definition, of the HTML page containing or loading that script. And I mean, that's why I don't like the term origin, because origin sounds like where does something come from. But what's even more important is where is it used? So I prefer to say the security context. The security context of JavaScript is the origin of the HTML page that loads and contains the JavaScript code. So that's basically my, uh, my definition. And of course, that means that the uh, that injected JavaScript code runs on an HTML page, HTTP example.com port 81. So it runs in the same security context as our own code. It's like when you develop an application and there's this one new team member that may skip uh, code review. That's what cross-site scripting is, right? Someone can just check in code from a security perspective. That, of course, means that you can do a lot of things once you inject JavaScript code. For years, the main uh, threat when cross-site scripting was successful was that cookies were stolen, cookies containing, say, session IDs or tokens or something like that. Nowadays, that's different. We'll briefly discuss this in the next session as well. We can protect cookies from cross-site scripting these days, right? So that's, that's also one of the reasons why modern single-page applications, for instance, do not store uh, any JWTs or any other tokens in local storage because they are gone when there's cross-site scripting, whereas cookies are not gone when there's cross-site scripting when done right, right? Still, that doesn't mean that cross-site scripting isn't uh, dangerous anymore. Instead, you can redirect very easily. So you redirect to a website that looks exactly the same as the original website, just prompts you for credentials. Uh, or you could manipulate the DOM. So if the, your bank's, I don't know, login page would, uh, would have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, then a cross-site scripting attack could just change the uh, action attribute of the login form. So the form would look exactly the same you would enter your credentials because you look at the URL. Yeah, yeah, that's my bank, that's my bank. And once you hit login, then your data is sent somewhere else, right? So that's, these are the dangers of cross-site scripting. But wait a minute, I mean, is, isn't that trivial? How does cross-site scripting usually work? Let's just use that, what I mentioned before, that you inject something into the HTTP response. Okay, the attacker sends us some payload, maybe a script tag or something like that. And the problem is when we take that payload or that data and then we output it verbatim without change. If it's a script tag, it's sent as a script tag in an HTML context, the script tag means run, run that JavaScript code. But 
I mean, isn't it, isn't it trivial? I mean, there, there are only five special characters in, in HTML that initiate a context switch. The angle brackets, because they delimit tags. The double and single quotes, because they delimit attribute values. You can also do attributes to uh, inject JavaScript code, on click equals, for instance. And the ampersand character, because the, the ampersand character is used for HTML entities. And PHP, I think back to version two, had the HTML special chars function. And yes, I know it is flawed in a way for historic reasons, because by default it doesn't uh, escape single quotes. Because, you know, back in the days, everything SQL, HTML, was kind of considered to be pumped into a string. So HTML special class left the single quotes alone because they had a specific meaning in SQL. Don't, don't ask me for the historical details. I do know them, but I'm a bit too embarrassed to share. Anyway, so you have to provide a second argument, ENT underscore quotes, that also escapes the single quotes. Of course, you could uh, uh, prepare your HTML so that it is only using double quotes, because if you have only double quotes in, in your SQL, uh, in, sorry, in your HTML, then you do not necessarily need to escape single quotes um, because uh, uh, then you, you cannot inject uh, new, new attributes uh, like that. Still, better be explicit in what you uh, want uh, to have escaped, so better, better use ENT underscore quotes. Right? So it should be, should be super simple, but still you have seen the chart, still, still a problem. Um, now, um, now we could say, okay, we are done, right? Whenever you have payload from the user and you output it, uh, then, then escape those special characters and you're good. And if you're using uh, frameworks, those frameworks, especially if you have, say, an, an MVC-like framework, I know Laravel, for instance, and then you have your views, and then in those views, you output data, or basically you bind data um, in, in the HTML, then you have HTML escaping by default, right? So we should be safe, but, but still we are not. And uh, therefore, I'd like to have a look at some of the security measures uh, where there are or there might be uh, limitations. Um, and I mean, from uh, if you look at the server side, things should be relatively trivial as long as you are in an HTML context. If you are outputting user payload in, say, directly in JavaScript, then, sorry, your host, more or less. Uh, I'll have, have an example in the next talk where this just doesn't reliably work. So HTML special trust in that case would not be enough. But in HTML context, it's fine. But what about single page applications? The three most, or no, the, the two most popular frameworks at the moment are Angular number one, React number two. Um, what about them? Because uh, they can also bind data, but the data they are binding, they could have been payload from a while ago, but that could also be part of the URL. How is that escape? Well, let's have a look how these uh, frameworks are doing that. So Angular, Angular has a very nice philosophy from a security point of view. The philosophy is the framework trusts no one except for templates. So if you haven't uh, worked with Angular before, basically templates are, and I simplify a little bit, templates are like, like HTML snippets um, that you provide when programming the application. Since they're HTML snippets, I mean, they will be put into the HTML output. That's basically the, the idea. Now in Angular, you bind with the double curly braces syntax. And uh, let me, actually let me show you that uh, real quick. I prepared a very simple application. So um, I have an input field here and uh, I bind the value in this input field to the name property. And here, I just output the name property with the double curly braces syntax. So um, that uh, could look like this. Let's see whether the application is running. So, and you see, while I'm typing, um, my name appears. So, ah, that could be cross-head scripting, right? So script alert one. Wait a minute. Why do I see the script tag? Why is the script tag not rendered? So you see, he is escaping in place. It's used as text, and that's what the framework does out of the box. Why am I showing you this? Many frameworks do this, but you have to specifically know what's going on depending on your framework of choice, right? Only if you know the mechanisms that are ready for you, then you know the limitations. So uh, just in case you are using Angular, there's a different approach as well. Instead of outputting directly into HTML, you can also bind 
to DOM properties. So you know attributes that what is in the HTML and DOM properties is something accessible via JavaScript. So for instance, I could bind to the inner HTML property. That's not a valid HTML attribute. It's a DOM property. And with this syntax, I tell uh, Angular to bind. So I can just say, okay, bind the name attribute at uh, the name property to that inner HTML property. Let's uh, try that again now. So application still working, but what about this? Hmm, nothing appears, but no JavaScript code is run either. Why is no JavaScript code run? Basically, if you bind something to, in, or if you write something to the inner HTML property, the specification says, if it's a script tag, don't run it, right? Okay, but I mean, we could do something like this. And so you see my name is now in italics and a typical, um, typical approach for, uh, for, for cross-site scripting um, is, is this. So uh, you could say, let's, let's use an image. And the SRC is whatever, p like php con. And you see that, um, here, after that hello block, here, you see that, well, it says hello, and then maybe something is coming. Okay, so let's, let's see what's that all about. So here, now I injected an, an image right, that can be seen here. But of course, it's not rendered. That's an error condition. So we could do something like on error equals uh, alert of one. Now you will see that still nothing happens. Why? Because Angular removes the on error attribute, right? So they have an allow list of allowed attributes. And this also can be uh, configured to some extent. I just want to show you that, that you understand that even if you have a built-in security mechanism, you need to understand it so that you know what the limitations are before you accept arbitrary data from your users without uh, sanitization, for instance, or without proper validation. Uh, a special case are URLs. So um, if I say do something like phpcon.pl, then this link here, you see this here on the very left, right? Goes to phpcon.pl, and we can have a look at that link. All right, so here we are, right? So can, and, and that's the same, same, uh, same syntax here, basically, right? So I just write that value in the href attribute. Now, I could do something like JavaScript, and then I could hit colon and then alert one. Look what happens when I hit colon. Look at the link in the dev tools. Ugh. Unsafe colon, JavaScript colon. So again, built-in security mechanism, but you have to know about these things. Not every SPA framework has that. So if you allow arbitrary URLs from your users, and they start with JavaScript colon, that's welcome for cross-site scripting, right? So just, just keep that in mind. That's why I wanted to, uh, to, to show you that example. There, uh, there's also React number two on the market, and I'd like to show you React as well, uh, at least on the slides, because I like what they are doing uh, from a didactical point of view. So what they do is basically when, when you bind data there, and so you see it's a single curly brace, not double curly brace like uh, Angular. When you're binding data there, it's also HTML escaped, right? So the same thing happens there as well, and that should be the norm for, for all frameworks these days, which again, is good as long as you're in HTML, but if you leave HTML, you're a host, uh, more than later. But they, for instance, do not have this, uh, this special handling of URLs. So if you bind something to the href attribute of a link, be super, uh, super diligent in, in what kind of data you're binding. So wh why am I mentioning React? Because, I mean, there must be an API in each framework where you say, yeah, yeah, output this data, but I want this to be rendered as HTML because it's a piece of HTML I trust, right? But, which absolutely makes sense, but you have to specifically say, yeah, here is some trustworthy HTML, please render it, thank you very much. Now, the attribute to be used within React is called dangerously set inner HTML. It's not called set inner HTML, it's called dangerously set inner HTML. So while you are typing, you, you kind of feel someone, you know, standing behind you, watching over your shoulders, asking you, 
are you really sure what you are doing here? And I mean, even in code review, even if you've never seen React in your life, if you see someone, okay, we have a new line of code in our markup, it's called dangerously set in HTML, um, then at least you may question yourself, okay, do I really know what I have been doing here? And that's something I like. And we'll see the same approach in, in another area um, later in this talk as well, where the name of part of the API um, kind of hints you at, you have to know what you are doing. All right, so far um, about uh, single page applications. So we see, okay, in PHP, trivial to defend. In single page applications, there's at least some base protection by default, but still, the situation is getting out of hand. So remember the chart from the beginning of this talk. Cross-site scripting everywhere. So who else could help us? We talked about the language, our web framework. We talked about client-side frameworks. What else? Oh yeah, we have browsers. So um, Internet Explorer 8, the, the best browser ever written, uh, no, really, it, it originated a lot of security features. It doesn't make it a good browser, but it, a lot of security features or ideas came from it, a lot of good ones, plus this one. That's, that's in another bag. Um, they introduced something interesting, a cross-site scripting filter. So the idea was, let's build some heuristics. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, it's 2023. Let's build some AI that um, then essentially um, tries to find out, is a cross-site scripting attack going on? Something like, hey, wait a minute, there's a script tag in the query string, and the same script tag is on that page. <coughs> cross-site scripting. So in that case, we got this little notification here. IE has modified this page, and then, of course, a lawyer saw all of the text, and then there is some, some legalese in that that helps prevent cross-site scripting. We're not promising anything, right? It helps prevent cross-site scripting. Um, it was... It sounded like a good idea, but you know those, I mean, I always have things that sound like good ideas, and then, you know, <laughs> the next day I like, oh, wait a minute. Um, because, I mean, what, what were the, the design goals for this filter? A, it had to be fast, because if IE takes five seconds to basically check whether there's cross-site scripting or not, would we as users then say, oh, thank you, I, I, I love to wait those five seconds just to be secure, or would we just say, wait a minute, IE got even slower, no, I'll just install Firefox. Um, so that didn't work. Um, and the second design goal was no false positives. So if websites did some fishy things before, they should continue to work. Yeah, of course, this didn't lead to uh, a good, uh, good result. Um, so then, eventually, all the other browsers first followed, except for Firefox. Firefox always said, no, it's not a good idea. It has to be fast. It ha does not need to catch everything. I mean, what's, what's the point? All the other browsers implemented the same thing. And nowadays, that feature has been removed out of all browsers, right? Because in the end, it wasn't good enough. And in the meanwhile, under the umbrella of the World Wide Web Consortium, a new standard had been developed, and that is Content Security Policy, or CSP. That's a defense and death mechanism that, again, does not prevent any cross-site scripting vulnerability in your code, but it makes it harder to exploit it. So I would like to spend some time in showing you content security policy so that you see how, that's, how that basically works. And I hope to motivate all of you to add this to your web applications. Well, actually in the 30 minute breaks, to be a break between my two talks. That should be ample time. Um, so let's see how that works. First of all, there are three versions of content security policy, and I'm putting this in front because I would like to, to show you the, the differences and explain some things. There is a version one that was once a, a candidate recommendation at the W3C. That's one step prior to uh, a, a standard, a final standard, but then was demoted to a working node. A working node is if, you know, I take a piece of paper, write something on it, and then throw it away. That's a working node, right? So let's ignore that. Why is that, uh, was that that way? because work on version 2 had already begun and um, then ended in late 2016 and became a World Wide Web Consortium recommendation, so a final standard. All modern browsers support this version 2, so that's what we will be working with. There is a version 3, 
which gets updated. Um, so when I, when I wrote the slides a few weeks back, uh, the last edit was uh, late September. I think there has been an edit early November as well. But an edit to that working graph often just means, OK, I found a typo, I fixed it. Um, version 3 is spareheaded by Google, which isn't a bad thing, or the Chrome team, which isn't a bad thing, but it's a working draft, right? So it's in progress. And so what Google is doing, and they do this with a lot of JavaScript APIs as well in, in Chrome, while they are working on a standard, they are already implementing the current state of the standard in their browser but can change it at any time. And that's why many other browsers uh, or browser developers then say, yeah, I, I, would, I would rather wait until it's a standard and doesn't change and the API is stable, because then it makes sense to implement it. Because if there are changes, we are probably the last to know. Um, and therefore, uh, version 3 of uh, con uh, con Secure Policy is only available in Chrome-based browsers. So Chrome, uh, Opera, Edge. Um, uh, and and uh, Brave, I think. Um, oh no, not Brave. Um, but depending on uh, uh, on on your um, on your device. But yeah, uh, but basically Chrome-based browsers. Um, and there are some changes coming. Um, also, uh, something will be renamed. But still, it's backwards compatible so far. And as long as this is not stable, I think Safari and Firefox won't, uh, won't add this. And therefore, we have to stick with version 2. But all I'm showing you now is version 2. And uh, that should uh, actually be, be good enough. Now, what about content security what policy? What is that? Essentially, the server tells the browser where to load all resources from. So basically, you tell the browser what the expected behavior of your web application is. If the browser tries to do more because injected JavaScript code tells the browser to, well, the browser checks with the policy and says, uh-uh, that's not allowed. Uh, let's refuse that. And so this can be really great defense and death mechanism. Here's how it looks like. So you send an HTTP header. You could also use a meter tag, but you have more uh, features with the HTTP header. And it looks like this. The header is called content-security-policy. And the value is an, an arbitrary number of so-called directives. Directives are the things with the dashes or the hyphens. Default dash SRC, image dash SRC. And each directive can have an arbitrary number of values. Even if you have never seen content security policy before, you may have a hunch what's going on here, right? Uh -huh. So default SRC self. Maybe that means load all resources from the current server. Yes. That is correct. That's exactly what that means. But for images, we have a different rule overriding the, the default rule. Images can be loaded from self, the same server, and from that static.example.com domain. And now it's getting interesting. So uh, of course, this also applies to other resources, like including JavaScript. So if you say something like default SRC self, that means only load JavaScript code on all the other resources from the current server. So if someone is injecting script src equals attacker server.pl slash bad script js, that script would not be loaded because it doesn't come from default, uh, from, from self. So at least one cross site scripting vector cannot be exploited any longer. Well, uh, let's try this out actually. Um, I have a, uh, a sample application. Uh, it's, it's an enterprise app uh, because it's microservices based. And you'll see that in a minute. Um, so uh, what, uh, what have I done here? Actually, we can close that one. Um, I have, um, I start with the logo. And since I'm stingy, um, I just stole the logo from the conference website. So I don't have to pay for hosting, right? And then I found out, yeah, the logo is nice, but it needs some, some design goodness. And I consider myself a very talented designer, as you can see. Uh, so I, what's this? I have to laugh myself, sorry. Uh, I have to, I assigned a background color and also styled it with uh, width and height a little bit, OK? And then I have a, a placeholder here. And then uh, I'm loading a templating engine. Uh, I'm using underscore JS as a templating engine here. And then. I call code, I, I run code uh, every 1,000 milliseconds, so once a second. 
and there I call my, my microservice. This microservice returns the current time. And then once data is there, I just call update time. What's update time? I define this here in the JavaScript file. Uh, so basically update time takes the template, which I set up. The template is current time colon placeholder. And then, well, fills, fills that placeholder here with the time from the microservice and then writes it into the, um, into the placeholder, right? And so that's why the time gets updated every second. Okay. Told you, very enterprise the app. So let's add a content security policy. So header, content dash security policy. Then let's just start with default dash src self. Okay. Sounds good, doesn't it? And I reload and ugh, my beautiful logo design is gone. That current time string here was much bigger before, and I can hardly see that on the distance. Bad eyesight. And of course, the time is gone. OK, so what did I do? Hmm. I mean, one error is probably obvious, right? Here, I was stealing the image, right? So the image comes from 2023 PHP CompL, and then maybe, I don't know, in the assets folder. That not, that's not self, right? That's a different server. So I have to add this. And I always try to be as specific and as narrow as possible. So I'm using the image src um, directive. And say, OK, self still needs to be allowed, because I may have a fav icon, for instance. And then here, everything in that folder. OK, let's refresh. OK, um, I liked my version of the logo better, right? But still, the image is back. Functionality mm -hmm, is uh, is a little bit lacking. All right, let's maybe have some time to to fix this. Let me let me go on actually in the in the slides. So, when when loading resources, there is a variety of directives. Here's a list of the most common ones, and we don't have to discuss each of them uh, individually. For most, you immediately see what they're good for. We have already seen default SRC and image SRC, and then uh, let's just pick some arbitrary ones. Font SRC is for web fonts, right? Um, media SRC is for audio and video files. Style SRC is for style sheets, and script SRC is for JavaScript. And default SRC applies to basically everything, and then those individual directives, they apply to a specific type of uh, resource. And <clears throat> you already saw that with that in place, I cannot inject script, equal, uh, script SRC equals some other server.com because that's not on the allow list, so that wouldn't work. The only thing that would work is script src equals some file on my own server, in our scenario. But yeah, if there's malicious JavaScript code on my server, then cross-head scripting is probably the least of my problems, right? So um, actually, we should be relatively safe, but still, the application is not working, so we, we need to fix that. Um, Let's quickly have a look at the values we can use for those dash src directives. We can use star, which says allow everything. Mm, OK, better be explicit than narrow. Uh, we could provide an origin. We can provide a URI. We provided a URI for the assets folder on 2023 PHP CompL, if you recall. Then we have self, and then we have none. I have great news for you. With the directive script src none, you disable exploiting cross-site scripting on your websites. You also disable all the JavaScript code on your websites, right? So there's a small catch, but still, it might help. On the other hand, if you want your code to run and injected code not to run, you need to think about something, something different. Well, um, let's, let's go back here to the browser. Why, why is the orange color gun, and why is that current time so small? Let's, I don't know, let's, let's have a look maybe at the, uh, at the markup. So here is the color. I think the size was different as well. And here would be the font size. I mean, do these two, two things have something in common somehow? These are both inline styles. Now the thing is, when, when I have a content security policy that applies to style sheets, so default SRC is set and or style SRC is set, then inline styles are deactivated. OK, I mean, when you do a modern application, then you don't do inline styles anyway. For legacy applications, this means you probably need to refactor. 
when I have a content security policy that applies to JavaScript, which means default SRC is set and or script SRC is set, then inline JavaScript code ceases to work. Ah, ouch. I have inline JavaScript code down there. Hmm. Okay. And I mean, there are two options. I could enable inline JavaScript code. I can do that in uh, content security policy. And um, I mean, if I was to write the specification, I probably would have called this, I don't know, enable dash inline. But that's so simple that people just would do this without thinking because if you allow inline JavaScript code, you allow the exploitation of a cross-site scripting vulnerability because then people can inject script alert one, right? So you don't want to do this. And that's why it's not called enable inline, it's called unsafe inline, right? It's like dangerously set in HTML. You have to type unsafe, right? And then lightning will hit you, right? Unsafe inline. Um, I mean, unsafe inline um, for, for JavaScript is a no-go. For CSS, in many cases, that's acceptable because you cannot really inject JavaScript code with CSS. So we could try something like this. Um, I go to here, then style src, I allow self, and I say unsafe inline. So, no lightning hit me, excellent. So let's refresh. Ah, the size is back, and the color is back. All right, um, so what do we do next? We still have the problem with our uh, inline code here. Ah, that's easy. Cut. Paste. No inline code, right? It's now an external file. Best practices anyway for JavaScript from a performance point of view. Refresh. No change. And there's a second, uh, let's say, side effect when having a content security policy that applies to JavaScript. Not only is inline JavaScript code disabled. And again, it's disabled for a good reason. We want to prevent cross-site scripting, right? And inline JavaScript is cross-site scripting. No, another effect is it disables eval, right? So we have eval as we have in PHP. We have eval in JavaScript, which runs JavaScript code that's there as a string at runtime. And of course, that could also be cross-site scripting if that string that is then supplied to eval comes from the user. Now, I'm not using eval in my code, am I? But there are constructs in JavaScript that are basically equivalent to eval. For instance, providing a string to the set interval code. And I can also do this for user-defined sorting, stuff like that. Um, OK, no problem. I could refactor this anonymous function and then this would be eval uh, and evil uh, uh, anymore. But the application would then would still not run. And the problem is, and I'm not thrashing um, an, a third party library here. I was just using that as an example. I'm using underscore, underscore JS. And I mean, here in my case, I, I don't really need underscore JS because I have exactly one template and one placeholder. But just imagine you have a library like this uh, embedded into, uh, into your application all over the place. You can't get rid of this. Let's have a look at the underscore JS source code. And um, I mean, let me just scroll a little bit through that. Um, and uh, you see, yeah, it's a lot of code, but that's not the point. I oh, actually can like, directly look for things. You see that here, they're, they are, they're creating a string, and that string suspiciously looks like JavaScript code. And and in the end, they then do a new function. And new functions also like eval in JavaScript, right? So that is blocked by content security policy as well. OK. Hmm. So what do we do about that? Yeah. We, we, I mean, I can yank out underscore JS. Um, but if this was a complex project, that would require extra work. So I could also say, OK, maybe I do want to re-enable eval. But if I do, I have to check each instance where this eval is called and whether the user can supply any values there because then it would again be cross-site scripting. Now, where do I use the templating engine here? My template is current time colon and then um, 
then a placeholder, and that placeholder comes from a microservice and it's the current time. There is no JavaScript in the current time because um, here that's, that's basically the code that generates the current time, right? Okay, so I could uh, allow this again, and you can guess once how that value is called, then it's called unsafe-eval. So just to prove my point, um, let's go back here. And then for script SRC, once again, I allow self. If I load JavaScript libraries from a CDN, I need to put the path there as well, and then unsafe, not in line, I'll hurt you. Um, it's uh, not unsafe enable, that's, that's just something I made up. Unsafe evil, <laughs> sorry for that. And if I refresh now, um, I have to click here, I think, then uh, the application works again, right? Um, and I mean, I, I, could, I could talk about content security policy for, for hours, and uh, I've uh, worked with a lot of companies making sure that we tailor a content security policy that fits to the application. My recommendation is in general, start with a content security policy from day one, um, because only then are you certain that the application works with that content security policy. It's much harder when you already have a legacy application because you basically have to test everything. And with regards to testing, there are two more things I'd like to, uh, to show you, I'd I like to, uh, to discuss. One is, there are other options to re-enable inline code. Because, again, with a legacy application where you have, I don't know, script tags sprinkled everywhere, um, you cannot, m maybe you cannot just move everything out to an external file. So there are two options. One option is to use a token, a number used once, sometimes called nonce number used once, and so the idea is you calculate that number used once. Here it's A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, D, e, F. Okay, that's, that's not random, right? So you use maybe the new random features in, uh, which we just saw here in this room in the PHP 8.3 talk, right? You put this in the content security policy in this format, um, uh, single quote, nonce, dash, and then the, the token, and then in the script tag, you add a nonce attribute and you set it to the same value. And each time the page reloads, different value, but the value from this policy has to match the value from the markup. And basically you tell the browser, inline JavaScript code with that nonce, that is allowed to run. So as an attacker, even if I can inject a script tag, I have no idea what that nonce is, what that token is, because it's different every single time. Right? So you do that when you control the markup. And what if you have some really weird framework that injects script tags, um, but you cannot control those script tags, but you know what's in them? Then you can use the hash of the content, the, the fingerprint, so to speak. And the idea is this. In the content security policy, you use the uh, SHA or SHA-256, 384, or 512 hash of the contents of the script tag. So basically, blank, slash, star, blank, code, blank, star, slash, blank, has this SHA-256 hash, which I abbreviated a little bit. Um, and then you tell the browser, OK, inline code that has exactly that hash, that is allowed to run. So you specifically allow specific code. So that's ingredient number one. So you can selectively enable inline code if you absolutely need to. And usually you need, may need to in legacy applications, but you may not need to in modern applications. But still, I, I know that um, many, many people, developer, uh, developers, uh, companies are afraid of slapping a content security policy on an existing application. And um, I may have a, a remedy for that as well. There is a, an, another directive, it's called report URI. Whenever there is a policy violation, then the, the browser automatically sends an HTTP POST request to the URL that we put in the report URI directive and uh, uh, sends us all the data about that policy violation, so uh, in, in JSON format. So which URI, URL, uh, which policy was violated, in which line, etc. So that's great to know because what, what are the two only reasons for a policy violation? Reason number one is we have an error in our policy. Marketing added a tracking pixel and we forgot that server. 
uh, to add that server to the image SRC list, right? Okay, we need to fix that. And what's the second reason for a policy violation? Yeah, I see some of you laughing, so maybe if marketing does that, you do not want to fix that, but yeah, that's, uh, I'm, uh, you, you have my sympathies there. Um, but what's the second reason for a policy violation? Um, we have a cross-site scripting vulnerability and someone is actively exploiting it. I mean, we want to know about those policy violations, so we're using the report UI directive anyway, implement an endpoint that then, you know, looks at the data coming in, etc. And even better, there's a second HTTP header, content security policy, report only. The name says it all. So um, we get a content security policy, the browser parses that policy, looks at it, uh, checks uh, whether there are any policy violations. If there are policy violations, we are informed about that, thanks to the report URI directive. But the policy is not enforced. So the application runs exactly as it did before we had a content security policy. So when we have a content security policy for a legacy app and we think the policy is good, we implement that reporting endpoint. We use the content security policy report only HTTP header. And then we wait two, three weeks. Let users use the application as before and then just wait for policy, for, for policy violation reports. If we get them, we fix something. If we don't get them, we can safely assume the application works exactly as before, but with an additional extra layer of security. And that's exactly the, the strategy I generally recommend when uh, working with content security policy. I've got one more topic for, for the remaining um, minutes, uh, which I also think is, uh, is uh, useful to you especially if you have a JavaScript-based application. Because for JavaScript-based applications, those we inject something in the HTTP response is not a big problem. The big problem, rather, is that something is written to inner HTML which is not trustworthy. We already discussed that Angular, React, other frameworks, they have some safeguards against that. But still, this writing arbitrary stuff to inner HTML is a problem. And there are two approaches that can make this better. But those two approaches are not applicable yet to all browsers. That's the important thing. So it's like my, my look into the future. So uh, um, maybe, maybe next year there, there will be more and more to discuss here. One thing is the HTML sanitizer API. So the idea is we have a simple API, random HTML string in, save HTML string out. So script tags, for instance, are removed on XXX, attributes are removed like on click, on error, etc. Um, all of the browsers are committed to implement that eventually, but at the moment, it's a bit different between Chrome-based browsers and Firefox-based browsers. Each browser implements another part of the specification. Uh, also in Firefox, there's a feature flag which you have to activate, so we still need to wait a little bit. Until then, there is an open source library called DOM Purify, uh, super fast and free. Uh, here we are. Um, and what DOM Purify does is basically it has a, you have a JavaScript API, as I mentioned, string in, sanitize string out. And it does this in the shadow DOM, super fast, actively maintained by one of the leading cross-site scripting researchers, right? So they know what they are doing. Uh, I think the latest version is from September or so. So it's really, yeah. So less than, less than uh, two months ago. Uh, so still under active development. Um, but the, the main uh, contributor to that project himself is part of that HTML sanitization, sanitization uh, API, uh, sanitizer API effort um, because he basically he wants to get rid of that project. He wants that baked into browsers. But yeah, there will still be some, some time until this is the case. And uh, till then, there's something that uh, originates from the Chrome team and currently only Chrome-based browsers are ported, but I find this super interesting. So let me briefly show you this at the uh, end of this presentation. So um, there's a, a concept called trusted types. And the idea is, with trusted types, we do not want arbitrary strings to be written to inner HTML. Now, what can we do? We can use a content security policy, new directive, require trusted types for, only value is script. And um, the idea is this. Uh, actually, I think we have time for a small example. So how about we use, let's use that one. 
Um, so um, I let's call this so uh, trusted types. Um, and so the idea is I, I add something in here um, and then I write this to inner HTML. And then here I have the text representation of that. So you see here what's written into inner HTML. So if I use some markup, how about this? Uh, phpcon, pl. If I write this to inner HTML, that's what's written to inner HTML, and that's how it looks, right? So uh, we have uh, italics. So of course, we could do something like, well, we can't do script alert one because of reasons I already told you, but we can try image src is something on error equals alert one. And if I write this to uh, inner HTML, we have cross-head scripting, right? So that code is, is run. And um, what I can do now is I add a meter tag. And then I'm using exactly that content security policy. So content security policy and the content, so the value is this require trusted types for script. Require trusted types for script. All right, so that's my meter tag. I refresh, I try the same thing. Maybe this time alert of two. And then you see nothing's happening, right? Because I was just writing an arbitrary string to, uh, to the to inner HTML, and that is blocked. But I have another button here. This writes the string to inner HTML, but wait a minute. It does not write the on error part, the JavaScript injection. It only writes the tag and the SRC attribute. And that's the Storm Purify, um, the Storm Purify library. And that Storm Purify library has a, mech has a mode. Usually it is string in, sanitize string out. But here it's not a sanitized string that's returned but a trusted HTML string. And when I'm using trusted types, I tell the browser, do not allow any uh, normal quote unquote strings assigned to inner HTML. Instead, only allow trusted strings. And Dom Purify uh, generates such a trusted string, right? So you can therefore kind of enforce that uh, when writing something to inner HTML, you first have to create such a trusted string. Of course, you can do that yourself, just instantiate the class, but it may prompt you to run it through such a library. All right, so that's something um, maybe to look forward to, and again, to add uh, an extra layer of security to your application. So you've seen why cross-site scripting is bad, how you defend uh, uh, from it on the server side, on the client side, now in the future, and also how to apply a content security policy um, to have great defense and dev uh, coverage. Uh, for any questions, I'll be here all during the whole break, and afterwards we'll talk about the OS Pro 10. So more security and another cross-site scripting demo if you're interested. Until then. Thank you very much for your time. Looking forward to or appreciate uh, reviews on uh, Joined In. And uh, thanks for being here and enjoy the break. Thank you very much. Thank you.